Ping pong. Ding dong, ding dong. Kia ora anō. Welcome back to this uh, council meeting. Uh, we're up to item 10.2 on page 61 of councillors' agendas. Um, just before we start, as we go into, in, into question time on this paper, if you could please have page numbers for your questions um, ready, please, because in the last discussion it was a little bit difficult to work out where councillors refer were referring to on the council papers, so just... Just uh, flagging that now so you've got time to prepare that. And to present this report, we have uh, Steffi and Janice. Welcome. Um, kia ora koutou, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm here to introduce the report on the local governance statement. Um, this governance statement is required to be adopted by Council under the Local Government Act, um, Section 41I. And um, I just wanted to point out that the governance statement and the governance structure are slightly different. So the governance statement is required under the Local Government Act and there are specific um, pieces of information that are required to be in it. Um, and they're outlined in the Act. Um, they're also outlined in the report. So those are the processes by which the Council engages with the community how council makes decisions and how the community can interact to influence decisions. So all of that is outlined in the statement, whereas the governance structure outlines how the governance, the structure is set up and what co delegations each of the committees have rather than how community can engage. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, I'll open the floor for questions. Councillor Coe. Um, <clears throat> yes, look, I have some questions around uh, Section 9, which is Māori partnerships, and um, I know I have talked before about having more of a, a, a paper that sets out the, the landscape in this area, and because um, um, our, you know, our obligations are to uh, Māori more broadly than mana whenua, and so I just... Um, wondered if I think it would be useful to have a bit more of an explanation around that. And when we talk about uh, under iwi partnerships and co-governance, um, our three iwi, um, there are more iwi than that in our area. And I think we just need some explanation around uh, how we like we have relationships with mana whenua, but how do we engage with wider Maori? There is like we talk about it in there and say, um, uh, what do we say? Uh, um, yeah, uh, and at the end of that first paragraph, it talks about um, enabling the, the council to meet its obligations and responsibilities under the Treaty of Waitangi to local iwi and the wider Maori community. <clears throat> so I think it would just we just need to have some explanation as to how that works in terms of the wider Maori community. We have a we have established relationships with mana whenua, but how do we engage with the wider Maori community? Yeah, so that's an ongoing and quite a big question. I'm going to ask yeah. the chief executive to respond to that. Uh, Janice is going to lead us off, and then I'll chip in with. Oh. Sorry, we've just been um, having a quick read of that session while you've been talking, but I think um, 
Uh, the, the first point that I would make is that our engagement with um, Māori more broadly um, uh, exists um, alongside of and as part of our partnership, as well as existing by itself. I, I, I don't think they are separate things. They are things that, that are uniquely tied together. Um, there is, for example, specific provision made for understanding um, the views of Matawaka within the within the uh, district, within the memorandum of partnership with our iwi partners that guides the operations of Te Whakameninga or Kapiti. Yeah. Um, uh, you have a, um, an upcoming session with Paul Beverley, who is, um, who is a, a well-regarded, deeply experienced um, uh, senior lawyer working both for iwi and for various crown organisations across the Motu uh, in this space, and I think that that session with him will help um, answer and unlock some of the questions that, that you've been asking, both today and in previous discussions. Um, so I guess uh, if I can answer your question with a question back to you, um, is your suggestion that we need to explain how we work with Māori more broadly within the document, or are you flagging that you have ongoing, lingering questions that we need to, to help answer? Well, or is it a bit both, of both? Both, really, yeah. Okay. I, because, I, you know, all these relationships were entered into before I was in this role, mm -hmm. and I, I, I have a lack of understanding in this area. Yep. Uh, but I think also, if I was uh, a Maori person in, in this community who was not part of mana whenua, mm -hmm. uh, I would probably have some more questions around how council is engaging with me. I think we can certainly take that feedback on board and noting that one of the draft recommendations on the table for you today is that you um, enable the chief executive to make changes to the document mm -hmm. as things mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, um, that's a space where we could look at whether or not there are, um, whether there is some additional content that we could put in now, but also as you as councillors um, uh, deepen your understanding and um, and are, are um, uh, placing new expectations on us as staff, we can keep this section of the document alive and changing as, as we all start to work in a different way in relation to this topic. So um, unless you have very like, specific wording that you want to lay on the table today, I think the, the right approach would be that we work with others offline to amend that section oh, of the yeah, document. Look, I, I don't have specific yep. wording, I just want to flag that... Yep. Um, you know, to have something in there that is meaningful to somebody who is mm -hmm. not associated with mana whenua. It's a good point. I'm very happy to take that away. Thank you. Oops, Thanks, sorry. Thanks, Councillor Coe. Look, just, just to echo uh, Janice's words, it, um, it, it's an environment that, that is constantly evolving and one that we are constantly learning uh, more and more about. Uh, and so part of the, the challenge for us is to ensure that we are able to provide you with the appropriate information, support and, and training as required. So really um, looking at some of what the training we have planned, I certainly hope that will um, give you a better level of comfort as far as understanding how we engage mm -hmm. uh, and, and who it is that we engage in. Uh, and there are much wiser heads uh, in this room that, than I when it yeah. comes to the subject, so I am very mindful of that. Um, as Janice d has touched on, the document uh, is a live document and we do have an ability to make those uh, alterations as required. So as our learning continues, so that so the document evolves. So I hope mm. that, that assists. Yeah, and noting too that that session with Paul Beverley was originally planned for some months ago and has had to be postponed due to situations outside our control. Um, thanks for that really good question. Um, Sophie... Hanford, Councillor Hanford. Kia ora, kia ora. Just a question in regards to the Code of Conduct, which is um, given reference to on page 76, and others may well be aware that the local government, local government New Zealand has released a new template for codes of conduct for different territorial authorities across Aotearoa, and one of the things that's been, it's been upgraded to include is reference to upholding principles of te piriti o waitangi, so I'm just wondering whether there'll be an opportunity for us to review our code of conduct, noting also that the last time um, it was adopted, or the time it was adopted in its current form was 
12th of December 2013, so I feel like it may well be good to reflect the changing times um, and also noting too that another kind of main element that's been um, given reference to or, or been highlighted or improved within the LGNZ template is mediation as first approach to resolution, which I think is also something that is um, potentially relevant, but also just something to include as, as kind of a fallback. So just wondering when the next opportunity to, to revisit our code of conduct will be. So we're currently reviewing that against the template um, and we will bring that to council. Hopefully in May we'll have a briefing with council on the new code of conduct and what we can change for this council and what we could update. And then also in May or June it will then be adopted and we'll have a new awesome. code of conduct. Cool. And all of those things that you mentioned, they're all included in the review. In the draft. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to have proofed and reviewed this <laughs> and some changes made, which is great. Um, I do note that the next representation, oh sorry, uh, for, uh, page 86, so the next representation review is to be carried out in 2027, not in time for the next election in 2025. Um, if this council was of a mind to progress a Maori ward in addition to the arrangements that we have, it's not, and I've emphasised this once before, this is not an instead of, it's as, it could be an as well as, um, and we wanted to progress that um, for the 2025, um, how doable is that? inside this framework. So yes, conversations are currently being had with staff on time frames and what that would mean because um, there is also a change to legislation on the way that will possibly come into effect soon. We don't have exact time frames and that would require council to consider whether to establish a Māori ward. Right. And if this council was to decide to do that, then a representation review would have to take place next year, and we would have to do that. Um, if the decision was made not to establish a Māori ward, then, as you say, the time frames are as outlined. Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to add? Councillor Halliday. <coughs> Yep, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Bear with me a little bit here. Um, look, in the first... Sorry. <laughs> Mr Bean moment. <laughs> um, uh, just on housekeeping, I noticed that um, Councillor Wilson said that he did... A, that obviously, he's been through and read some of this. But um, a couple of things. Um, uh, sorry, bear with me here for a sec. Um, page 94. Uh that's just before I get to 94. Uh, page 94, um, it says the next long-term plan uh, will be adopted um, for the financial year 2022-23. I'm assuming it's meant to mean 2023-24. Uh, second paragraph down, um, long-term plan, at the end of the long-term plan, uh, at the end of that paragraph. The next long-term will be lodged for the financial year in 22-23. Yeah, is that correct? Cool. That's, That's correct, yeah. Um, would it have been, look, just again, just some feedback. Uh, would it have been um, handy to have actually had these pages numbered? Um, the um, statement is not numbered. Um, the uh, pages, uh, we, we just referencing backwards and forwards when we're going through it was just a little bit difficult um, as such. So I appreciate just if it might be something's being added in later on, but if that could be yep. in the front end of the process, that would be great. Um, page 74. Um, the number five appears twice. So you've gone uh, four, five, five, six, seven. Um, yeah, so uh, you've got... Um, Just a numbering issue. I'm sure yeah. we'll sort that out. Yep, we can do that. Uh, Thanks, Councillor Halliday. Nope, it's part of the um, statement. Yeah, so, so number five appears again on page 78 under the next... Heading, so we just need to change that numbering, yep. I think. Yep. No, just that numbering, I th and I'm yeah. assuming that'll flow through. Um, that's cool. Um, I'll take this one offline, that's right. Um, it was just to do with the calendar. One question I did have, um, 
council here refers that council meetings are supposed to happen every four weeks or every month. Yet our calendar that was um, done on the um, on the um, uh, 24th of November, uh, there's a gap in September. Um, interestingly enough, perhaps Mr. De Haas can confirm this. Uh, who's gone? <laughs> okay. uh, that notes. Uh, I think it's on October 10th. There is conf there's a council meeting for confirmation of the annual plan. I would have thought that would have happened in June. Uh, but I'll, I'll take that offline. Yeah. That, that's uh, all right. Just October would be annual report, I think, rather than annual plan. So we'll, we'll check and oh, make okay. sure that we've got things labelled in okay. the right way. No, no, that's cool. In terms of the gap in September, um, there are several several points throughout the year where there is a two-week hiatus. I won't say break because I know that... Um, that you're all very busy, despite the fact that we stop putting meetings in your diary. But there is a hiatus of meetings at several points throughout the year, often aligned with the school holidays. Um, and that does mean that sometimes the regular four weekly cycle for council meetings or six weekly cycle for subcommittee and community board meetings does stretch out a bit to accommodate those breaks. Oh, look, again, I was just again, I was just wondering whether this statement, whether we had to do it within four weeks or there's flexibility there. Um, as such. Um, uh, you set your own rules, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, a question I have around the governance um, statement versus the government structure. The governance structure sits on our website um, and as such. Will the governance statement sit there as well? Does it sit beside it or does the statement update the governance docu uh, structure document? So the governance structure exists independently of the governance statement. Um, the governance structure is established via a report um, uh, to council that, that you all voted on. The governance statement um, is uh, maybe um, one way to describe it would be the governance statement, although legislatively, legislatively required, is essentially a communications tool that pulls information from a range of other places right. and, and puts it all in one place for someone who is interested in understanding how the decision-making process works and how they can be involved. They do hang out in broadly the same parts of our website, um, but they are, they, although they are related, they are independent things that exist of themselves. Okay, um, I'll flag um, the conversation around the name of the Social Sustainability Committee, but we're going to be discussing that next week and start having a conversation with you before. Um, so um, I do want to bring up, and um, this will be discussed at the next meeting, that meeting as well, um, is the designation of um, the Social Sustainability Committee and the Environmental Committee as subcommittees. Um, I look at that as a perception aspect with regards to people looking at delegations and who's doing what, where, why. Um, this has been, these two committees have been classified as major committees, um, but when people look at um, the information in general, if you like, it just comes across as a subcommittee, which I think diminishes um, the, um, uh, the strength of the perception of the committee compared to other committees as such. But I'll bring that up at, uh, at the discussion on that Monday as well, as part of that. Um, in regards to um, what Councillor Coe was talking to, with regards to um, uh, stepping into the Māori EV world, with regards to how it's it comes across in these documents, and I refer um, to Mr Baker with regards to a comment he made a couple of meetings ago, with regards to consistency in wording, and um, I noticed there's some instances here where. In one instance, Mano Fena is referred to. In the next instance, Evi is referred to, and and there seems to be just that lack of a consistent approach to these words. Um, I'm not going to dine at the show with regards to here, but um, I think it ties into what Councillor Coe was talking about about us needing to have a meeting around this or um, uh, some discussions around this so that we can bring it in line with um, with with um, with thinkings if you like, when that can be confirmed with our EV partners as such, um, around those sorts of wordings. If we are going to be moving forward with regards to ensuring that our wider community is brought up to speed on the different terminologies, then I think it's really, really important that we get the correct wording. And it can only be slightly different, like the difference between mana whenua, tangata whenua, iwi, 
um, hapu, all that sort of scenario, but we have to be consistent in that. Otherwise, we'll start getting um, little holes picked on us as well. But again, I'll just flag that at the moment, uh, that I'd uh, really like to have that conversation uh, moving forward, um, and uh, more than one. I think we need to have quite a few conversations around this so that we are moving forward on the same page. Um, other than that, that's me. Thank you very much. Councillor Pavanov. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so on page 80, um, we've got a picture of the, the governance structure. Um, I just want to double check. Um, so you have a number of committees that are, that are sitting on the right-hand side and then you've got the Grants Allocation Committee at the base. There's no connections to any of those committees to anything else. I'm just double checking to make sure that is how it should be. Yes, the reason it's kind of been designed like that is because it sits to one side and um, has been created to make decisions on grants on its own, mm -hmm. rather than actually reporting up recommendations and then decisions being made by council. Hence why we designed it like that. But we welcome feedback on how we that's been yeah. designed. Okay, so I suppose that very clearly sets out probably what Councillor um, Halliday has just mentioned is that you've got some of these, you know, you've got a number of committees um, and yet you've got two major subcommittees. You've got some committees that are decision makers where you've got two subcommittees which basically don't can't make any decisions. Okay, so on page 85, and this was sort of raised by Councillor uh, Wilson, um, it says, I think it was 85, um, somewhere in here, that makes a comment that, um, on, yeah, on 85 it says that um, council is required to review its re representation arrangements at once every, once every six years. And then on the next page it says that um, the next one will be carried out in two, uh, is tw 2027. And I actually am a bit concerned that that decision has already been made about when that is going to occur, whereas there can be a lot of water underneath the um, bridge before then. And so it, I think it, that the wording in there, it, will ha it happened before then, is mm. probably a better way of putting it. So the date has been set by legislation. We, ha we are required to do a representation review every six years. However, if a decision is made this year to establish a Māori ward, then uh, one would actually be um, conducted next year. So the wording here is the next representation review will be carried out in 2027, which means that is the mm -hmm. year it will be done rather than before then. I think we could um, amend that text to read something like the next representation review must be carried out in 2027 um, uh, if not earlier, or something yep. to that effect yep. that that makes it clear that if there are reasons why you would initiate a representation review, you, for example, a Māori ward, you could do one in this cycle if you chose to. Thank you. How do I? Oh, cool. Uh, just, again, looking at page 80 in the governance diagram structure, uh, just and it might link into what Councillor Pravana was talking about in terms of how does all of these committees fit together. Just a question: Is it uh, is uh, Tefaka Meninga meant to be included or not included formally on this diagram? I'm just trying to sort of check: Is it um, based on what was the thinking at that time? I think it probably should be. How does that? We've, because I was just thinking, like, is it something where the council is the chair, in which case it's in that formal structure, or is it like a side sort of relationship? So, so the, the reason that it hasn't been included on this diagram is simply, and we can have a discussion about that, but it's simply because it's not actually in the governance structure document mm -hmm. as one of the committees that report up to council because it sits separately. It has its own terms of reference. It has its own set of... Um, it, it has its own agenda. It has everything is set up separately. So hence a decision has been made not to include it in the diagram, but of course we could have a discussion to include it and reflect it in there and then figure out how do we fit it in there so that's clearly um, outlined that it does have its own terms of reference and it's not connected to the governance structure directly. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think it was. Um, I mean, I'm I'm fine if it's not, but I think just more that sort of clarity of the, you yep. know, these are the ones that are formally, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So roll up to council, and then there are other sort of bodies and relationship groups Absolutely. and other things that sit separately. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. So just just following up from that, I think that's a really good point. Um, do we have the ability to make that change to the governance structure and hence the governance statement? Um, yes, and I think um, the, possibly the other point to note there is that um, this is also something that um, uh, the council and its EWI partners could choose to explore as part of the review of the memorandum of partnership. The status of the Whakameninga is something that, that could be explored as part of that too. But yes, we can make make changes as as and when they're needed um, and, and deal with the procedural stuff behind that. Yeah. That's great. Is it Cam or Glenn? Both of us. Both of us. Yeah. I'll, I'll go double act. I'll go first quickly. Hey, um, just a quick one. On page 72 and 81, um, they both show Carl as being the deputy. Uh, chair of the Paraparan Community Board, which of course it's now Guy Burns, so they need to be updated to reflect. We will amend that. Thank you. Ken Butler. Kia ora. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just following on from um, Kiruwai's comments, so where were, in terms of the government's um, structure would community boards be represented in there? I know like within the actual subcommittee that names who's there, but in terms of the overall structure, there's no representation on the community boards. So, are, are you referring to the diagram? Yep, yep, yep. page 80. So, the reason they haven't been included in the diagram is also because they're independent from the government st structure. They're um, bodies that sit outside of council. So, that's why they haven't been included. But once again, we can have a discussion how we... Oh, so there may need to be another diagram that represents bodies um, such as the community board and others that... Outside. I think it would be nice if they had boxes yeah. rather than just being listed. But we um, don't want to be put in a box. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was just, just raising that point about if we're looking at the whole governance structure, it was one of those comments that came back to the representation review of a lot of people saying, well, where does the community board sit? What do they do? How do they interact? Well, with I, 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 th I think in general what um, you're talking about is how do we demonstrate visually for our community what our representation arrangements are and what um, what mechanisms are put in place to ensure good governance within those representation arrangements. And the, the diagram that you have in this document, which is specific to the governance structure, the, the pieces that the pieces of that pie that an incoming mayor and their new council can make some decisions about, that's the only piece that you see on the diagram in front of you. But what I'm hearing is that you want us to be able to demonstrate to the community what that total picture of representation and governance looks like. And I think that's a really good point. And again, um, hopefully um, you will be comfortable that we can work up something and add that into the document over time. Thank yeah? You. Thank you. So... Councillor Coe, were you going to have a new to, line of questioning? Or? Yes, yes, look, I just wanted to follow up on something that Councillor Pavanov talked about, which I think oh, is, is, quite it a, is it a question? Yes. Well, okay. it is a question. Uh, yeah, otherwise you can follow it up during debate if it's okay. not a question. Well, I, can, I can do that tonight. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just trying to keep the questions a little tighter. So I'm not seeing any more lights, so I'm going to go to the recommendations. Oh, sorry, Andre. Got uh, you there. Tēnā koe, I think it would be helpful if the meeting could uh, note the question raised regarding the terminology that's used mm -hmm. to define your partnership and your relationship with mana whenua. Uh, the Local Government Act is not helpful to us mm -hmm. because, as I've said previously, it profiles us all as Māori, mm -hmm. and it's not accurate. If we're having to work in the RMA space, which we do, with this council, the RMA is really helpful because it refers to mana whenua. And that creates the obligation for us to not only recognise our inherited responsibility for being here for over 200 years, but for those individuals who choose to reside here in our district that may well be affected by uh, an application or a proposal for development that will impact upon a Māori family. 
in our worldview, ordinarily uh, the relationships that do exist in this community of the district um, absolutely allows us to identify those individuals as Ngāti Pro, mm -hmm. as Ngāpui, as Ngaitau. So across the various business and operational sectors where we are active, and you've got Ngāti Tor, which is a post-settlement iwi, 20 GPs and nurses and clinics all over the place, put it to pie here in Kapiti that, that we effectively are responsible for operating. Um, there is a relationship across social service sectors as well, um, activity across education, where we get to know those Māori families that reside in, in our district. So I'm, I'm wanting to encourage further questions from our council about how we profile our community and how we may be prepared to signal our dissatisfaction that a colonial term is conveniently used to identify those indigenous people of this district. And so I welcome the debate and the discussion. And of course, if you had not taken the position of welcoming the governance of the three iwi to this table, we then would not know how we need to interact with one another at this governance level, rangatira to rangatira, in terms of how we manage our future goals and aspirations for the whole community of the district. And that does mean that we need to debate the situation regarding the proposed Māori ward. At the moment, we've reached the destination where you actually have a requirement now to have your mana whenua partner sitting here at the table with you. That's huge. And Te Whakamining or Kāpiti deserves uh, recognition. And so I also want to note that at uh, our Te Whakamininga meeting, uh, there has been a recommendation quite clearly uh, that in partnership we review the terms of reference of Te Whakamininga. I think that relates very um, importantly to the review uh, that this council adopted to, uh, I guess, reflect a mature relationship moving forward. So comfortable to debate these matters. Um, Please, that councillors are wanting to ask about how we define ourselves, how we profile our relationships with one another. But just lastly, know that mana whenua have the ultimate responsibility of kaitiakitanga for those families who reside here uh, who are not related to us directly through our whakapapa. It's an inherited responsibility that we've maintained and that we will continue to maintain um, under the terms of the Treaty of Waitangi. And so if there was any family who does who resides here, who you know of, who requires our support, uh, who requires our uh, engagement, um, you have the three Iwi sitting here as mana whenua who are recognised across the legislations of this country who have a responsibility and duty of care to respond. And just emphasising again, we do that as best we can across many, many different um, services that the three iwi provide uh, to those particular communities of Kapiti District. Thanks, Andre. So I'll move now to the recommendations on page 61, the agenda. Can I have somebody to move those? Councillor Wilson, seconded. Uh, Councillor Kirby. Right of introduction. Well, I think the report... Ah, Sorry, I think the report um, speaks largely for itself. Um, there's a question... I think the questions that were raised have been acknowledged. Um, just um, in response to uh, what Andre was saying, I think... Um, and where this fits into this kind of report and where we go in the future and the discussions, this is notwithstanding what government legislation is coming down the pipe anyway. Um, but it just further emphasises to me that there's a knowledge gap here. Um, and it can't... I mean, I've been in council meetings and it's felt like I've been here for 200 years as well. But 
in reality, I haven't. And so everybody else is playing catch-up, and we're all playing catch-up at different speeds. And so I think one way to clarify a whole bunch of issues would be to um, sit down and have a proper hui meeting that we can clarify a whole bunch of issues. Because every time Andre speaks, I learn something. Um, I'm not being patronising about that. It's true. I really do. Um, but we don't get... Um, he's a busy man, so we don't get that many opportunities to, to have a chat outside of council. But I think we would all benefit from having that process because a, a, a Maori ward, and that's what it's being officially called, so that's, that's a reality that we're going to have to have a really proper conversation about. And it won't be an uncontentious one, I wouldn't think, given where council... Um, sat last time. So, again, I think it, it, if we get the opportunity, we had a rum -a roll, we had a bit of a chat, but it was very early days. Lots of us didn't know which way was up. And so, well, what questions to ask? It got a little contentious and stuff, but, and I think we lost our way. And I think it would be really helpful if we were able to get back into that space um, and have a good conversation, you know, where we can clarify a whole bunch of things. And for my part, I'm really willing to do that. Um, I'm pretty sure Mana Whenua would be as well. And I think we, as a way forward, it's great. And just uh, just last point, Andre's completely right, of course. Uh, Ngāti Toa here is, is very well resourced. Um, with, you know, the settlement has really helped that situation. Um, other iwi and hapu aren't in quite that position yet. And so the, so the struggles aren't, you know, the, the struggles are real for everybody, but the, the resourcing about how you do, how you do that um, is, is tricky as well. And, and it's something that we as a council need to factor in in terms of the resourcing of everybody at the table being able to be represented, et cetera. Anyway, that's my cup and twist. Anybody else? Noting that um, there was a significant contribution from Mr. Baker during question time. Uh, Councillor Coe? Yeah, just um, a, a point that, following on from what uh, Councillor Pavanov said about the structure, <clears throat> the Risk and Assurance Committee is very much out on its own. And um, I'm gather gathering a perception that uh, there is a feeling that we can just delegate everything off to the Risk and Assurance Committee and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, I've said on a number of occasions, I think there needs to be a direct line back to either Strategy Ops and Finance or to full council um, on matters of significance that we are all responsible for. So whether there should be some kind of a line back to one or other of those committees to reflect that, um, because we, it's not a self-contained thing. Uh, and it's, it's doing work on behalf of the full council, almost like a, like a subcommittee but with external people in as well. Um, and there needs to be that line of communication. Can you add that in? Yeah, I agree. So um, we're, we're taking note of some, some changes to be made to the governance structure and to the statement. And we're going to get them up on the screen shortly, I think. So, um, anything else? Anybody else? Oh, well, actually, the other thing I'll just add, yep. and I think, talk, uh, coming back to um, Councillor Halliday's point about subcommittees, um, I mean, my under interpretation of that is that those committees are not committees of the whole, and therefore they are subcommittees, which means it's like it's a, a smaller group than a full committee. I don't think it reflects their importance, just the fact that it... It doesn't contain, it's not a committee of the whole, that would be my interpretation. Yeah, I think there was some confusion around that because there are committees like the Risk and Assurance Committee which are committees because they were sitting by themselves. So it could be that once they're reporting back somewhere, then they have to become subcommittees as well, d depending on who they're reporting back to. We'll take all that offline and have, an, have a look. This is obviously a living document, very much alive. So um, there's been a few points made today. What I'll do is 
I'll put the motions that have been moved already and then we'll get the other ones up on the screen and we'll move and second those. So we have two recommendations, 3A and B, on page 61 of Councillor Agendas, which have been moved and seconded. Any right of reply? Waived. Oh, so I'll put that. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. And we just have a further recommendation, I think, which just um, encapsulates some of the suggestions that have come through today for some further changes to be made to these um, documents. So the team will pop that up on the screen for you to have a look at. Um, I guess uh, what, what we've tried to capture there, what we've tried to capture there uh, is the, um, I guess the substance of the changes to the governance statement document that you have um, flagged or asked us to look at today. What we haven't tried to do is capture the list of potential changes to the governance structure that you have talked about today. So the designation of subcommittees versus committees, re the reporting lines, that kind of thing. That, that's, those are matters that we would bring back before the council in a report to amend the governance structure should you decide that that, that was how you wanted to go. So if you don't see things like the very recent conversation around audit and risk on that list, it's because it's a separate conversation to amending the governance statement, which is what's in front of you now. But um, rest assured, we're very happy to bring that back before council in the right way. Okay, so potentially, uh, just for, just for our own records, and so we know that the points that we've um, we've made are going to be followed up on. Could we potentially have an email with some of those changes that were that were mentioned today, and we'll follow not not to follow up straight away, but in the fullness of time yes, as we review the governance structure. Absolutely. So uh, the, the same movers and seconders, happy to move that list as well? Moved yep. by Councillor Wilson, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any debate around those? Just a, uh, just a question about um, the, whether we need to be um, explicit about the subcommittees as being advisory committees as opposed to decision-making committees of the whole. I don't know if we actually refer to them like in, I think it's quite clear in their delegation. It's, I think it is clear in their delegations. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, I think that is a question that we explore in terms of exploring the governance structure rather than exploring the governance statement, which you have in front of you today. Yeah, and, and we can look at reviewing or increasing delegations over mm -hmm. time as well as those committees set in. Mm -hmm. So um, I've got a mover and a seconder for those that see up on the screen. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, and it's great that these have been um, these points have been um, captured here. The other point that I'm just wondering whether would be worthwhile to capture is that um, that um, that some of these may require us looking at the governance structure, and that's not actually in there. Uh, in terms of the list in front of you. I don't believe that any of those would require us to look at the governance structure. Those are, um, those are. I, I, m my take on that is that it's they're either minor editorial changes where we've got some dates wrong, or it's about asking us to describe um, describe something in a different way. I don't think any of those are um, directly impacting the governance structure itself. Well then, if I can suggest that maybe there do, does need to be something, because there, there has been quite a lot of conversation around the, the actual governance structure, about about yeah. how it is, and um, one of the outcomes of that is actually revisiting the governance structure. Yeah, so so we've we've made a <laughs> commitment to send out those changes and have a look at the governance structure, that needs to be a separate um, process. This is about the governance statement. Here, is what I'm saying, yeah. is no, what it's I'm not, saying. no. Well, so I've sure. had a mover and a seconder for those up on the screen. Rest assured yeah. though we will. We will. I have a question. Yep. Uh, ten I'm interested to know um, what obligations and engagement of Iwi means when we then identify mana whenua and, of course, we're understanding the reference used um, 
I guess, through central government regarding Māori. Um, can I suggest that there's some clarity about that? Because that would suggest to, the, to us that it's an obligation to iwi who we would consider to be your mana whenua representatives, your partner. And should it perhaps read with however that is amended, if it is amended? Yeah. I'm just asking the question because I'm wanting to know what mm. expectation does this create for councillors reading that? Mm. Who's iwi as opposed to mana whenua? And I'm satisfied that Māori is consistent with the way that it's shown through the statutes. We've discussed that today, so I, I can appreciate from our perspective that refers to those who perhaps are not affiliated to the mana whenua that you have your formal partnership with. So are we changing that to with rather than of? Can we do that, please? And is the suggestion that we have mana whenua in Māori, is that in, rather than iwi as well? I, I'm seeking direction from this meeting so that we're very clear about the Council's reference to the term iwi uh, and mana whenua because when we're sitting here, iwi and mana whenua are the same. I think we're qualifying the conversation and debate we've had about those people who live within our district who effectively may not identify themselves as mana whenua and they're referred to as Māori as much as we don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Certainly legislation mm -hmm. describes those people in that manner. Thank you. Is that what's on the screen now? Is that, I think you're more able to provide guidance than the, t the rest of the table, potentially, and how do I? I tēnā you koe, Yona. Yes, I, I think that is far more appropriate and, and far more transparent for for us. I move and seconder, happy with those amendments? Okay, so I'll put that now. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, that's carried. Thanks for all the work that's gone into this so far, ongoing. We'll move to item 10.3, public art panel, revised terms of reference and approval to appoint members. On page 101, of the agenda. So we've got we've got Rosie Salas coming to the table to present this report, and Mike Mendonca. Tēnā korua. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Councillors, elected members. Um, can I introduce Rosie, please? Rosie is the advisor at uh, um, uh, Museums, Arts and Heritage. She is the Museum, Arts and Heritage, Heritage team, and she has done all the work on this report. Uh, Rosie's got a big year this year, two big chunks coming up. <clears throat> the first is um, our art strategy hasn't actually been um, revisited since 2012. So um, we're giving that a good nudge this year, and, and Rosie is leading that work. And the second, of course, is that uh, we expect the uh, Mahara, Mahara Gallery to be opened um, in just a matter of well weeks now, rather than months. So, so um, that again, I think we'll we'll see a, um, a step change in, in the focus on the arts within the district. So uh, the recommendations before you today um, reflect those changes. We think we need to change gear, shift gear, and we've um, given you recommendations around potential. Uh, public art panel members who we think can take us there w with respect to those two changes. And also, um, we're recommending a couple of minor tweaks to the terms of reference that we think will also help us get us there as we shift gear this uh, this year. So that's what we really wanted to say. We'll take the report as read, um, Madam Chair, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll now invite questions. Councillor Coe. Um, yes, look, just with regard to the proposed remuneration for uh, members of the art panel, yep. there's two um, representatives there. I just wanted to clarify whether the remuneration goes to the person or to the organisation that they're representing. Um, I think it, it's intended to go to the person to cover their expenses. Um, we've always had an expense right. account for um, minor expenses such as travel um, and... You know, I mean, we haven't ever had to um, 
remunerate for uh, or re recompense for um, oh. accom accommodation. And, and I want to be clear that this is an honorarium, which right. in its definition is a recognition oh. of a contribution yeah. as opposed to a remuneration for like meeting fees or something. Right. Um, and the position does remain voluntary. Right. Sorry, does that answer your question? Yep, yep. Yeah. And the second question I have is, um, would it be appropriate for the public art panel um, to be consulted in terms of any major, you know, building development or whatever, yeah. in terms mm. of the, you know, like the indoor art requirements for that. And I just wondered if mm. that could be reflected. You know, would it be appropriate to have that in the terms of reference as well to formalise that? I thought it was. Um, it's certainly in the public art policy. Um, uh, sorry, in the in the former strategy. In the, right. strate the strategy for supporting the arts in 2012, yeah, well, it actually it actually um, does yeah. indicate that that is the intention, and the public art panel has a role in that. But yeah. I take your point. Uh, I will check that that is. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't. I thought it was. Sorry. <laughs> um, it may not be absolutely explicit. Well, yeah, it is sort of. It's sort of there, but it's. Um, I think it could be perhaps a little bit. Can I have a page yeah. number, please, where uh, it's sort of referenced? Uh, well, mm. 2.8 under the terms of reference of, page, of our, our yeah. page number is page 106. Yep. Um, so yeah, it talks about integrating public art into the... Yep. I just wonder whether perhaps that could be a little stronger in, in the mm. sense that the public art panel should be consulted, you know, you know, something around that effect to make sure it doesn't, it's not overlooked in terms of any construction of public spaces, that there's a more, right. um, the onus is on the, you know, the people developing these other projects to consult back with the, you know, to, pro well, to provide advice, you know, or I'm not quite sure of the wording, but mm. if you understand what I mean, it's about mm. Uh, ensuring that if there is any future development, that there is consideration given to public art in that space. So that would potentially go under um, paragraph 11 in, in, in the current document, which we would um, add in as I, a suggestion. I, but I think this needs to be... I, I actually, I'm just going to make a brief comment. I think it's quite clear under goals that the public art panel is appointed by the Kapiti Coast District Council to act as an expert advisor. And oh. then number two outlines the goals that the, that the um, public art panel are then supporting as that expert advisor. I think that's actually quite clear. Right. Um, in terms of indoor space, I wonder if that can just be added to 2.8, and mm. we can agree to that today. Yeah. Um, integrate public art into public space design, including town centres, facilities, open space, and buildings, including indoor space. Yeah. Does that, does that yeah, yeah, solve yeah. it? Yep, thank you. Okay, Mike, do you have anything? No, no. <coughs> Fantastic. Councillor Halliday. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of things. Um, with regards to number 17, uh, sorry, page 102, uh, talking around um, um, Māori representation um, as such and... Um, Perhaps um, speaking, give me some confirmation around this. But the representative, I'm just just curious: is 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 the representative coming for? Is it worded in such a way that the representative is coming from the art confederation, as such, um, or um, are we look are we talking about a, just a, a person, uh, an indigenous person who um, is um, uh, generally in the art scene in in Carpety as such? Um, so so the terms of reference state an art representative, uh, uh, sorry, an arts professional nominated by Te Paka Meninga, uh, and the important thing is for that representative to be rep be, be the choice of um, Te Paka Meninga sure. or Kapiti. Um, but it does say arts representative, and I apologise, I didn't actually include that in there. Um, but the, uh, the option is always open for Te Whaka Meninga to, um, to choose somebody who's not actually a member of Te Whaka Meninga, um, and that's um, up to Te Whaka Meninga to, to decide. It's important that they have somebody who's representing them that is, has their full confidence. Lovely. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, number 11, um, and I guess number 29, page 102, talks about um, strategic and advisory roles. Um, 
culture and uh, creative strategy development. Um, what's the story on actual delivery with regards to uh, public art as such? I mean, with, I, I appreciate we're moving to a strategic aspect and the, um, there needs to be an update. I've got no issue around that. Um, but um, are we taking hiatus from delivery as such or um, mm -hmm. are there projects that are on the go or will be on the go? There are definitely pro projects cool. on the go. Right, um, that the public art panel will continue in its role of general oversight and um, sort of advisory of uh, any project um, that comes comes through me to them. Um, there will be some that I think will be a matter of they're just having a, a look at it, and there will be some that, that will be um, more in depth. Um, consideration, review, whatever, uh, but it's um, this paragraph is just recognising that the, um, the strategy is in um, development this year and once it's um, uh, approved then they will have a key role in its delivery. Cool. And how does that, I'm just curious, how does that get reported back to the table, how are we involved in that process? Um, On the strategy sure. development? Um, oh. More work plan, just you know, seeing what's going on. So, uh, so um, <coughs> We're very mindful as we develop a strategy um, to be re realistic about what we can actually deliver. And whilst we don't want to constrain ourselves with an implementation before we've actually written a strategy, I'm very mindful that this is it in terms of uh, in terms of um, um, council officers. So a um, little bit of a horse and cut, councillor, but uh, um, uh, we will be using the normal reporting uh, mechanism, such as the quarterly report, to report back to you on, on progress. And of course, through the public art panel itself, also has a, a council representative on it. Fantastic. No, that's great. And, um, Sorry, um, just sorry. to add to that, um, Councillor, um, that um, we do present a draft program to Council from time to time. I think the last one was in 2019. Um, once the um, public art panel and other interested parties have actually um, approved that to go to Council uh, for your formal approval, so that. Um, I have been delivering on the 2019 one since then, so um, that will be no doubt refreshed. And, um, and apologies, I can't make reference to the um, uh, specific part, I didn't write it down for some reason, but uh, I noted in here that um, there's been an increase in public lit art, more community um, public art mm. or public lit art initiatives. I'm just thinking if you're moving to a strategic position, are we looking at sort of trying to perhaps, you know, you're a team of one, uh, whether we're trying to be looking at supporting those initiatives and partnering with those initiatives for delivery as such um, as part of that strategy? Yes, um, that was noted by the Public Art Panel at their last meeting, which was um, interesting comment that, that a lot of what had come before them had actually been proposals from the community rather than things that had come out from um, suggestions within the art panel itself, um, but um, it may be um, the result of the strategy um, that that is where the community would like more support for community organisations to deliver rather than council actually leading that. Um, we'll see. Cool. Um, the only other thing I wanted to um, perhaps touch on and it sort of um, dovetails a little bit what Councillor Coe was referring to around um, um, seeing what council uh, works are, are moving forward. But I'd like to sort of broaden that out a little bit with regards to keeping an eye on what current or future government infrastructure projects um, are out there as well that we can perhaps tag on. The reason I bring that up, and I'll flag this now, um, is um, we've got the way station, say, being built or proposed to be built down Paikokariki Way. Um, perhaps that's an opportunity, well, it's been suggested to me um, that that could be an opportunity to be looking at potentially a PO or some, some sort of um, um, entrance way into Kapiti as part of negotiated arrangements there at all. Um, but just wanted to flag that. Thanks, Councillor. So, so one of our challenges is not actually writing a strategy, it's easy, it's the implementation and changing culture to get people to think about this stuff. And with, um, with the greatest respect to Sean, and his colleagues, one of my big challenges is, is, is to get people thinking about this stuff while we're designing and thinking about infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, if we add it on at the end, it's kind of almost t too late. So, so this is as much about cultural change and thinking about yeah. stuff. Front footing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I can write that in the strategy, but actually it's our, our behaviour that is the key thing yeah. that, uh, that we need to, to, to change. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Councillor Cooper. Fine. Um, 
does this this panel fall under a council code of conduct <clears throat> and disclosures for um, the disclosures that we make around conflict? Actually, uh, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll ask you, Janice, to answer that question. The councillor code of conduct is specific to councillors, so um, members of the public art, art panel aren't automatically covered by um, code of conduct or, um, you know, by virtue of being appointed to that group. Across the different advisory bodies that we have, we do have some variation in our approach to um, how terms of reference for these different groups identify a process for identifying and managing conflict, and that's a piece of work that we're exploring as part of our advisory group review. Um, but sorry, I don't have specific visibility of how it's dealt with in these terms of reference. I haven't taken a look at that. Okay, um, you yeah, wasn't speaking specifically about um, conflict, but obviously that's a, a code of conduct issue. So uh, is there, it would make sense, so if, if someone in this panel who's representing the council does something bad, what is the process for accountability? Are we saying we have a process or are we saying we haven't got a process? I don't think we've said either. That's not, that's not <laughs> I think the terms of reference are silent on that, Councillor, but uh, um, I, I guess I would have faith in the people that we have selected and the Council representative on, on the panel to actually make the right judgments and the right calls should that situation arise. Uh, the same thing would apply to community representatives on the Grants Committee, for instance, and um, all the other and all the other advisory committees we have, the CWB, yeah. the... Um, so it's a wider question than just the public art panel. So maybe we take that away and have a little think about yeah. it. There could be a little, um, a kind of agreement that people yeah, I think we need have something. a little look at. Mm. Yep. And oh, it has come up before. Yeah. And it's been an issue before. Yeah, yeah good point. Panels, let, so let, let's take that offline and... Sure. Mm. Sorry, just talk over you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it has come up before. So if we could crack on, it'd be awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. That was my only question. I'm making that point again. <laughs> we do need to look at it. Just looking around. Councillor Warwick. My question is on 115. The co-opted members, will they get the honorarium? And if they're not, is, does that need, if they don't get that, will, does that need to be put in there? Stated. <laughs> It, it's a matter of our budget. Um, but it's, an, it's a very small expenses budget. Um, if we are co-opting people for a particular period of time, as opposed to the full training, um, then I would expect that we, we would be able to cover some, ex some of their expenses. Um, it's a good question, but um, it, that, that paragraph is in there to enable us if we think there's a strong need uh, based on a, a comment from the public art panel at the last me meeting that they really felt that there should be a greater diversity on the panel, um, particularly the young boys. I think the um, nomination that we have for one of the arts professionals is kind of covering that. Um, she herself isn't very young, but she works with young people. Um, but, the, um, but the option to be there and then in due course, if we see that we might want to expand that, then I guess we would take a case to council at some later stage for um, increasing that budget. So it doesn't need to be specified that they will or won't, or maybe partially? Partial, uh, do you think it should be? Oh, no, no, I, th I, th I think the answer is that no, it's not specified at the moment, and it would be dealt with um, if the need arose. Um, Councillor Wilson? Yep. Um, you're just taking out some of the points that were made earlier, given that arts um, should be fundamental to this district's identity, um, this becomes quite an important group um, and I would like to see far more resources put into it and see it grow. The arts panel, for instance, could have, if, and it's not resourced to do it at the moment, but if you take that um, ugly monstrosity on the Waikanae main road, the yellow bollards, which is appalling and everybody hates them. If an arts panel had had their say, 
they might have said, actually, that's not really a good idea at all, right? Um, there might have been some input, as Mike was saying, at the point of construction, or the point prior to construction, the point of conception for major projects, we can go, what's the arts overlay here? What's the, what's the culture and heritage box that we need to look at? Um, so, yeah. Um, the other thing I had, it's a bit tricky. Um, I'm not a big fan of making appointments um, outside of PE. And I'm a little bit surprised that we are doing that here. That um, I mean, I'm not, that I'm not saying that Robin, Josie and Janet aren't, aren't, aren't superb candidates, but given that we've got the CVs of the other candidate or applications of the other candidates who are in here, and the, the reason they haven't been chosen, I don't know why we wouldn't be... There's probably going to be no contention whatsoever, but if there was, this is not really a good forum for those kind of discussions, in my view. When you're selecting people for a public panel, uh, it should be done in PE, in my view. Oh, sorry, public excluded. It just... The, the reason... For that, of course, it just gives people the opportunity to be candid about their views. Um, I was candid about my view about risk insurance, for instance. Um, but I would have been far more reticent had that been public, um, just because you have to be more aware of sensitivities. But sensitivities sometimes get in the way of accurate information. So, like I say, there may be no contention whatsoever, but it's it's it's... It's tricky. Mm. And also, um, is it the, the council's representative on this is Council of Co, I believe? Yeah. Which would indicate there's not a lot of diversity in the panel. <coughs> appears to be a completely testosterone-free zone, um, which may be excellent. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but anyway, those are my comments for the word. <laughs> I, th I think <laughs> I think there'd be the odd um, panel across the country that was the other way around. So maybe it's maybe it's a balancing effect. Um, I'm going to get the uh, an answer to the the point about um, the, this paper being in public from our group manager. Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask Jenna to give it a go. Um, uh, the short answer is um, that in different circumstances, either is appropriate. Um, uh, there are some circumstances where um, public excluded um, is the appropriate place for consideration of this. There are other circumstances where, um, uh, given the degree of information that is being made available and the nature of the engagement, um, putting it on an open agenda might be, uh, will, would be appropriate. I think what we've recognised off the back of this conversation is that there's probably a need for us to um, um, develop just a little bit more guidance about which is appropriate in which situation. So thank you, Councillor, for, for raising this. I, look, I, look, I, I agree with you. I think this should have been in public excluded, and we'll look at that for future reports. Uh, Councillor Spires. Thank you. Um, I just really want to give some assurance to our young people. About four or five years ago, there was a piece of artwork that was removed from the skate park at McLean Park. Now, the young people have been waiting about four or five years for the upgrade, for that to be replaced. So the arts panel would not say to our young people, no, you cannot have this. They would support anything that the young people came up with. I think they want to replace what was said previously, but also there was another young chap called a car crash, um, Carter, I think his name was, they want to do some artwork there too. So I'm just looking at the power of the arts panel. So whatever the young people came up with would be okayed by the arts panel, that it could go there. So, so for that specific piece of artwork, which we know about, and, yeah. and it is in the pipeline, um, that, that, that just to be clear, that. There's no intention to kind of fiddle with what's already in, in train with respect right. to the skate park. Oh, 
Um, but with respect to the role of the panel, it is an advisory panel. So um, I, I, I wouldn't like to say that it would kind of uh, usher through anything that anybody said, be they young, be they old, be they whatever. So, so it is to give us advice. Uh, um, it, it's, it's, of course, the council's choice as to whether or not that advice, that advice is taken. And in the last triennium, there was a lot of advice that, that actually wasn't taken. So like with any, uh, I think council, like with any advisory uh, uh, body, uh, um, they, they don't have the final say, but the, 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 their role is advisory and, and to um, provide oversight and guidance. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. For me, just a, a short question, and this probably reinforces a little bit the uh, concern around public excluded or not. Um, I know one of the applicants was the previous chair of this panel, um, and he has been... So, so I'm just going to get some advice here. Um, mm. I'm wondering about um, moving the rest of this discussion into public excluded at this point. Is that something that we can do? Yeah, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjourn the discussion on this paper and we'll recommence the discussion once we go into public excluded. If that's something that I can do. The mover of the paper, I'm more than happy to. Okay. Mover of the we paper. haven't done a motion yet. Did we? No. I thought I'd moved it ages so ago. I'm just, I'm just checking around because I haven't you experienced that before, so I'm just checking around my ability to do that. No, you can do it. You're the chair. Yeah, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the rest, um, I'm going to pause this paper and we'll consider it um, um, after item 11, uh, kind of under the items, under item 12 on the agenda so that we can move on with the public, um, the public paper. So we'll pause this discussion now. So I'm moving the rest of this paper into public excluded. So we have Councillor Pravanov who would like to ask a question while we're in public. So I'll, I'll take that one question and then we'll pause the paper. Thank you. So I just wanted to clarify a comment that um, Mr Mendonca made when he opened this um, presentation. He said that the Mahara Gallery was opening very shortly. I just want to clarify if that is actually the state or whether the building will be completed. That's not even um, about this paper, so we'll take that question offline and we'll move on now to item 10.4. Amendments so to Council to delegations to staff um, on a page 116 of Council agendas. Thank you. I'll I'll um I'll just I'll just unofficially kind of answer that question. It, the door the doors will be open. The building will be finished quite shortly, but the public opening won't be happening until sometime later this year. Um, so we're moving on to item ten point four now. Amendments to council delegations to staff. Ms. Sarah Watty, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tana Koto, councillors, mana whenua representatives and community board representatives. Um, so look, this paper that you have before you proposes some amendments to council's delegations to staff. Um, usually I would largely take this paper as read, but I am conscious that this is the first time um, we have brought to you as a, as a new council, um, the delegations uh, uh, to staff. So I thought I would just make a few comments about this, um, which are largely set out in the report. So um, as you will have read, uh, council has the ability under uh, Clause 32, Schedule 7 of the Local Government Act to delegate um, its powers to both the Chief Executive and to staff. So, so there are various different acts um, that provide this, um, that provide powers for council and, and um, in some instances staff. Some of the acts require council um, to delegate to the Chief Executive and then the ability for the Chief Executive to sub-delegate to staff. Um, some require, such as the Resource Management Act, require um, council to directly delegate to 
staff. So it's so those acts um, do not provide the uh, the chief executive with the power of subdelegation. Um, it's a it's a technical point, um, but an important one. So. The delegations that you, you have the full delegations before you um, in attachment one, and those are accompanied by a number of different schedules which exist for each of the different statutes that um, that uh, apply to us in local government. Uh, uh, the um, the amendments that we're looking at, so sorry, the, the delegations roll over trainium to trainium. So the delegations that are in force um, at the moment have, have carried over from the last trainium. This paper proposes some minor amendments to um, council's delegations. So there are a few different um, a few different changes. The first one is some important positional changes. So either new positions that have been created um, across different council teams or changes to position titles. Um, there is some minor clarification to the wording um, relating to the Property Law Act delegations um, in attachment one, which really just clarifies council's role and ability to act as lessor, lessee or tenant. It's not a change to the delegations, it's just a clarification. Um, and there's also a couple of minor amendments that reflect updates to the new governance structure. So the change of name from strategy and operations to strategy operations and finance. Um, so that is the essence of the changes here um, and happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Councillor Pavanov. Thank you. Through you, Ms. Through you, um, Chair. So I suppose I've been around this table for a while, and um, I just want to ask a question, um, rather than having to dig through all the various sections here, that I know um, on occasions that, for example, community boards have delegations, and sometimes those delegations are taken away from them and given to council staff and maybe even in terms of other elected members, I'm wondering whether there's any situations in here that applies to. So the delegations from council to its committees and to its community boards are dealt with separately, and that is okay. that is the role of the governance structure, um, which we were talking about earlier. So the governance structure, um, within the governance structure document, council has the ability to, um, to make particular delegations, to delegate its powers as a governing body to community boards, um, and... Um, the, the, the current delegations um, uh, to community board members are set out in that document. So that is distinct from delegations um, from council to the CE um, or to staff, um, which are a bit different and generally relate to things that are operational. So rather than the governance um, part of our organisation, it's the operations. Um, and, um, and the reason for those delegations is... Um, is for, um, you know, it's not practical for council to do it all. So um, it's administrative efficiency um, and it's good practice as well that where you are able to delegate um, and it's an operational activity that you would de delegate that to staff. So that's the general um, premise that, that these delegations are based on. Does that answer your question, Councillor Pravanov? Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, so just to clarify, because I know in the community boards at one point they could make decisions on road safety and that was taken... Oh, that delegation was taken away from them to council staff. So that is a completely separate process, is it? Yes, yeah, and sure might be a better place to speak to the um, the technicalities of that or, or not, but um, it's probably a separate discussion. I mean, and, and there, I think you refer to, there is always the ability to for council to review its delegations and to make changes. Um, and so um, the changes you refer to will, will be a reflection of that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, good question. Martin Halliday? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, just a clarification, actually, and thank you for, uh, on page 117, number 8, clarification of property act, act delegations, um, and, and appreciate it being highlighted in the way that it has. But just to, one curiosity, one, what's that ex explicitly enabling, and two, what have we been doing up to now? Was it 117? The, page 117. Yeah, let me just yeah, find so it. It's a, um, Powers of delegation, delegation authority oh, exercise administer all responsibility choosing the powers of the council. And you've added in, including but not limited to acting as a leasee, leasor, or tenant under the Act, and any regulations made under the Act. Um, so tie, ties into page 130, I think, of the actual um, delegations. So, so, count, there are some things that council was not able to delegate. So, there's a there's a financial limit. I don't have it in front of me, um, Darren. Um, may have it at the top of mind or not, and um, and I would say 
this is quite a technical area, so where there are technical questions um, relating to delegations, um, and we bring these papers up probably you know, three or four times a year. Um, if you've been thinking about something, it's really good to receive it in advance so that we can take the time to consider it and come back to you. Um, broadly, in relation to the Property Law Act um, question, um, council, um, there are some things that, that council will need to make a decision on because of the value of a particular property transac um, transaction. Um, and there are some things that, that have been delegated to different staff members that so might sit at a group manager level or, um, or a tier three manager level, um, where council is able to act as a landlord um, or, a, or, or, to, or a lessee um, to approve um, a particular um, transaction. So that is what that refers to. Does that answer your question, Councillor Halliday? Oh, look, yeah, it does. Um, as such, and look, you, you make a good point about um, this being quite involved. And um, uh, I might give you, yeah, yeah, it was just a curiosity yeah. thing, then you had highlighted it. No, thank you very much. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, just um, I was just running on on the uh, if you go to page one twenty eight, just in terms of um, <coughs> delegations to the chief executive. It's only where the, the the chief executive can commit council expenditure to two point four million. It's only that, where that number came from. The two point. Can I just ask you which legislation we're looking at? Because oh. I've just I've got the um, the Sorry. report itself rather than the agenda printed out. Yep, we're under the Local Government Act 2002, and on here it's on page 128 of the order paper. So I believe, yeah. off the top of my head, that that might be a, um, a legislative um, number restriction, okay. um, and so the um, but I would need to um, to have a, a, a good look into that to give you. Um, uh, to confirm that advice. So we can take that away and come back to you if you are comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. I know, no, yep. it's just that, that number doesn't particularly ring any alarm bells for me, but I, um, but there's, through this process, the chief executive um, is, is um, running this through the strategy operations and finance committee, but is that prior or is that, um, is there anything prior about that, or does the chief executive go out, write out a cheque for $2.4 million, give $250,000 deposit, and then at the next strategy at Ox Committee, tell them, look what I did? <laughs> or is there... Is, so, yeah, so the question is, is it a prior... Is there prior discussion? And I, I, that didn't seem... Um, it says it's reported to the committee, but I'm not quite sure what the phasing is. Yep, th thank you. That's yeah. a really good question. I, I like how you how you phrase that. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's it's budgeted expenditure, so it's it's, yeah. it's approved by this council. So for argument's sake, in the long term plan, we might have projects that are approved. Uh, I, I can't simply go out and spend two point four mm. million dollars uh, without mm. it being approved. Yeah. <laughs> and and just a, a a note for what it's worth, and it seems to be pretty much. Covered, I think, across the board. I couldn't find um, any, any examples, actually. But the, in terms of delegations, that anything even remotely significant in terms of money, that the delegation goes through the chief executive and the chief executive then can sub-delegate that um, because the only person who's directly answerable is, is the chief executive, just in terms of accountabilities, right? Correct. So at a staff level, we have different types of delegations. So this is one layer of it. This is the sort of the first layer. And then we have um, um, this This follows through into our um, uh, warranting process where we're needed. Um, we also have um, specific uh, human resources delegations and specific financial delegations. So um, at a staff level, we're currently looking at that and um, doing a bit of a review to make sure it's as clear and um, as simple as um it's possible so that um, it's really easy to understand by all staff who need to navigate it. But um, but yes, we do have, um, I guess, uh, some robust processes around that, um, in including in our procurement. And just a final comment, is that, that, that actually adds a layer of protection to the Chief Executive, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Great line of questioning. Councillor Pravanov, have you got more questions that you didn't get to before. Sorry if I cut you off too soon before you'd finished. No, that's okay, thank you. I pressed the button because no one else had put 
had pressed the button I went first. So um, my, my question actually follows on from, my first one follows on from Councillor Halliday in relation to page 117, the Property Law Act. Um, I, and I maybe I'm a bit confused here, but it would be good to have clarification here about the delegation to exercise and administer all responsibilities, duties and powers of the council, including not limited to acting as a leasee, lease or tenant. So I know um, when I was the chair of the community board, often when leases were coming up for renewal, the chairs of the community boards were, you know, were, were asked if they, if they would like to respond to that. I'm not certain that that actually happens now, and I don't know whether that's actually part of a delegation or whether that's part of something else that actually um, has, has happened in the past and may not be happening now. Um, are you able to explain how that fits into the I, th I think I understand your question, but can I just can I just clarify? So are you talking about the input that, that community board members have into um, different types of property transactions? So it might be if a lease comes up for renewal, for example. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'm best placed to speak to a change in practice in that area. Um, is Chris, is I think that used to happen. I'm not sure if it does now. Yes. Um, I would, I would need to take that on notice and come back to you okay. and talk to the relevant team because I'm not sure about the level of input. Um, it, may well, it may well still happen, and, um, but, but could we take that on notice? Okay, thank you. So the other one too is that, um, and it may already be um, a delegation, but I'm just wondering, um, at times there's quite a lot of conversation around compliance with various bylaws about the level of, of warranted staff to be able to enforce those bylaws. And so, do council staff, well, are council staff warranted to be able to do that? And I know sometimes the, the enforcement agency is outside KCDC, but I'm just wondering what the capability of warranted officers mm. are mm -hmm. within KCDC. Mm -hmm. Yes, so not all um, not all delegated powers require a, a warrant, but particularly in the enforcement context, um, there is often the, require, the requirement for an officer to hold a warrant to be able to exercise a particular power. Um, and in those cases, um, uh, I think I alluded it to, to it before, but, but we do have a robust process um, uh, um, for the issuing of warrants um, in accordance with the, the powers that have been delegated. For example, under the, R the Resource Management Act, um, some of the powers are made direct from council to staff, um, and then they require a warrant to actually be able to be exercised. And so um, that is a, it's quite an administrative process that, that sits within um, our team. It's managed by the um, Senior Advisor Warrants and Delegations, um, who is in the back of the room here, um, and is, is a conversation between um, the relevant manager and our team um, to make sure that the warrants are in place before that staff member um, uh, exercises the powers, you know. So there's a there's an induction in terms of the the scope and capability required. Um, staff would obviously be recruited to positions um, based on their experience, and so there would be a requirement at that level to make sure that the the capability exists. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I can provide you my, with assurance that there's a that there is a robust process, noting that it's quite an administrative one, um, and um, probably wouldn't be at the level that um, that that you would want in terms of um, understanding all the the ins and outs. Yeah, so I suppose um, in relation to our bylaws, are there warranted officers who um, are able to? Um, Act on non-compliances when it is actually under the uh, the control of KCDC. Yes. Could you please um, item itemise the changed delegations that you're referring to in a page number? Would I, that I be okay? I don't actually think there aren't any change. There, there is nothing okay. here. Okay. So this is about officers. changes to the delegations. Well, this is actually just um, ensuring that it's actually covered somewhere. Maybe it doesn't need any changes, but I'm just wondering. Just ensuring that it's actually been covered um, by the current delegations, as there's no changes. That's all. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps I can respond, Your Worship. Um, thanks for the question, Councillor. Yes, we do have warranted staff. Not all staff are warranted yeah. to conduct the same activities. Yes. An animal management officer, for argument's sake, would not be able to go into a building inspection. I understand that. But, but I can assure you, 
that we have warranted staff and this report doesn't affect that. Do we have enough warranted staff? That's a discussion for another day perhaps. But we definitely do have warranted staff to deal with the legislative requirements that we need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, th thank you for that. And they're really good questions, mm -hmm. but um, I'd really appreciate it if for the rest of the council agenda today if we could stick to the um, content of the reports because we do have another 10 or so papers to get through. So um, we've got some recommendations here on page 116. Do I have a mover for those? Councillor Wilson, second to Councillor Halliday, got his hand up just in time. Right of introduction, waived, any debate? So I'll put that. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thanks, Sarah. Good job. Uh, so we move to, we're going to try and whip through all our public the, the next three before before lunch, if that's okay, because we've got quite a bit of um, public excluded to do after that. So we're going on now to 10.5, appointment of Mana Whenua representative on page 151. So this doesn't need to be in public excluded because it's um, to one of our one of our council committees, which is slightly different, I think. Um, kia ora koutou, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I will take the report as read, and I can answer any questions that you may have. So it's my pleasure to invite somebody to um, move these recommendations. I'm presuming there'll be no questions. Is a question? Oh. Yeah, I've, I've got Councillor Hanford offering to move that Kim Tahiwi um, is representative Nga Hapawa Otaki to attend a number of our committees, and um, Kim's been around our table for a while now, so I'm very happy to second that. Um, and also, I neglected to mention before that I think she's actually with us on Zoom, or at least has been today. She's dropped out just before her big moment. <laughs> but certainly a pleasure to be, um, to be considering these today and putting them to the table. So, so we have... Um, Recommendations five and six on page. Oh no, that's back. Uh, sorry, four A and B on page one five one, and that's been moved by Councillor Hanford, seconded by myself from the chair. Um, anybody else wish to comment? I'm sure we want to do a round the table. <laughs> uh, Councillor Halliday. Great having you here, Kim. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Coe? Oh, yeah, yeah, likewise. Good. Uh, <laughs> great to have Kim. I just wondered um, where we're at in terms of the other appointments. Um, Could we uh, take that offline, please, and just focus on the paper right. that's in front of us? Okay. We just, All right, thank you. Yeah, but good question, and we'll take a note of that. Um, Councillor Wilson? Yeah, I just wanted to add that the um, Kim typifies the value that was um, argued for. Um, and so her, her official appointment, I think, is, is fantastic. And that shows the value that you get when you've got um, good people at the table. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. Well said. Councillor Pavanov. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So I am very happy that this appointment has been made. Um, Kim has already been sitting in this um, in, in the Climate and Environment Subcommittee and has already, already added a lot of value to it. Yeah. Thank you. So that's been moved and seconded. I'm not seeing any more lights. So I'll put that to the vote. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Congratulations, Kim, and we look forward to continuing to working with you. Uh, so we have 10.6, confirmation of community board representative on page 154. A questionable <laughs> appointment. <laughs> so we have... Um, we're, I guess we're taking the report as read? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, it speaks for itself. So we have a recommendation for a 
that B. Laracy is the representative on Risk and Assurance Committee. This is just tidying up some of our other our community board representatives. So we've we've, ha we've got quite a lot. And I just actually want to take this opportunity to thank the community board members who have put their names forward. There's a a lot of roles now that have been offered to community board members, and the uptake has just been outstanding. So thank you to Bead, and uh, thank you to the others who have also put their hands up. So that's been moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Warwick. She got her hand Sorry, up first. Sorry, I had a question. Oh, I had a question. Oh, we've got a question. That's OK. Yep. <laughs> Councillor Halliday. Yeah, apologies. Um, that's OK. Look, I know it's a really relatively contentious question. Um, First of all, can I just have um, just clarity? Um, Bede's um, appointment is one community board member representing all community boards. Is that correct? No. Is this just Ramati? Is it? Just Ramati. That finish. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the one community board didn't get their act. It's together. the riskiest community board. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been moved by Councillor Wills. Uh, so we've got uh, 4A, page one. Five four, uh, been moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Warwick. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. So we now have ten point seven reports and recommendations from standing committees and community boards. Um, through you, Madam Chair. The report brings some recommendations from two community boards to council. So the first recommendation is from the Ramati Community Board and it requests that council develops a community education plan in, um, re in, um, in reference to Takutai Kapiti and then reports back to the next meeting. And we just note that the strategy and growth growth group are actually working on a communications plan um, that has been agreed with CAP and that it's expected to communicate with all of the community boards and include communications with the community boards. Um, just, just so that we're, sorry to interrupt, just, just so that we're being consistent um, about our commitment to responding meaningfully to these recommendations from community boards. Um, could council staff please work up a, um, a note to that effect to put under 3B on page 158 so that we can capture that in the, in the recommendations? Okay. 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 While we're doing that, um, are there any other Do questions you that you think yep. might be able to be answered? Yeah. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, just in, um, so I, I know this, this is, it's largely noting, but where we've got things like the Otaki Community Board, for instance, um, the, the KYS Graffiti Project, I'm personally not across that, and perhaps um, you need to be part of one of the community boards to be aware of that. And I guess the only other way of finding out is through the minutes from that meeting, and that can be... Uh, like a month on sort of thing. So I just wonder if if there is a mechanism, I mean, I wanna ra I'm not going to raise this now because it's, um, but if there's a mechanism, if there's something that comes back from these community boards that we broadly as a council think, well, that's really interesting. I'd like to know more about that. Mm -hmm. Can we, the, the, a mechanism for feeding into it, not after we get the order paper because then that just puts too much stress on the staff to suddenly find stuff and it wouldn't work anyway, it wouldn't make a practical sense. But I'm just wondering how how there's a, how there might be a better way to get information that happens at the community boards to the broader council other than the minutes. Even if they even if it's the community board itself indicating what it thinks might be of a broader interest. I would suggest that the chairs of the community boards could always email all the elected representatives if they thought that there was something of interest to the broader yeah, group. I mean, that might be good um, putting an imposition on staff to provide information outside minutes and this report, I think, would be... Mm -hmm. So we, we can encourage the community board chairs to do that, and I'm sure they'd, they'd be willing. We've got nods from the community board chairs who are here today. Great. Um, and I'm sorry I interrupted because we didn't get to the other, um, the other recommendations, so I'll pass back to Debbie. 
yeah, the other part I just wanted to point out was that the Otaki Community Board also made a recommendation. And one is just to note that the chair of the Otaki Community Board write to the remuneration authority um, requesting an increase in the funding. And the other recommendation was um, up to council that council also advocates for community boards to receive additional funding from the remuneration authority. And I just wanted to point out um, two things. One, uh, once again, that council on the 24th of November considered their remuneration and positions of responsibility, and also that there has been an email that has come out from the remuneration authority that seeks feedback on the process and just general feedback. Yeah, so community boards are welcome to participate in that process as are councillors. Um, I note that we had a, a similar recommendation from the Paraparumu Community Board at a previous meeting, and I'm wondering if we could have a similar recommendation today that we note that we'll be um, reviewing remuneration at a future date, and I can't remember what that date was, and um, that we'll consider it at that time, so that we're consistent with the recommendation that came from the Paraparumu Community Board. Okay, yep, and um, and uh, Mr Butler is going to speak to this recommendation. Sorry, Sophie. Um, so the actual recommendation that came from the Paraparamu um, Community Board asked for the, basically the division of the current pool to be changed, which would have been where the councillors would have to vote on the pay cut um, to give the community board members more remuneration to reflect their um, increased workload. The way we worded it was specific to actually go back to the remuneration authority to actually ask for the pool to be increased um, rather than divvied up a different way. So that would allow the councillors to retain their funding, but also for the community board members to um, have a little bit more money. Okay, so, so potentially we don't need that extra recommendation then, so we need to consider the second bullet point. I'll just keep passing around for more. Yep, Councillor Halliday. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to reflect back on um, Councillor Wilson's comment around um, uh, and using point the um, graffiti scenario. I'd just like to encourage councillors to perhaps, when the uh, agendas come out, to flick through them, uh, especially the dependencies for grant applications and that sort of stuff. Don't necessarily need to attend the meetings, but I think it's very. I, I find them very, very rich information sources with regards to just seeing what's going on around the district. Um, don't have to spend too much time on it, just nice to flick through, see what's going on in other areas. Um, that would be my recommendation, um, uh, other than start having to try and hook out what they might think is relevant compared to what other people might think are important, as important as such. Yeah, good point, and they're all loaded into our hub, nice and easy to find. Councillor Hanford. Yeah, kia ora, just a quick part in relation to the kind of engagement process with the kind of takutai kapiti project and I know that kind of the intention behind the recommendation at the Raumati community board meeting in February was that there was some sort of community education or engagement prior to the community formally engaging with the CAP so that what they were able to feed into that was meaningful and informed by um, at least some sort of information base so I just wonder in terms of the rollout of that comms plan that's um, been spoken of whether that will be before the CAP kind of formally engages with the community or afterwards, or, or alongside, or at the same time? So my impression is that the part of the um, takutai kapiti, or mm. CAP as you've called it, um, is to inform and educate. So mm. it's, um, it's that, that's part of what would happen as part of that process. So I wouldn't see a process as happening prior to that. Mm because that's what we've delegated to the Takutai Kapiti group to do. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. it's just making sure the community feels really equipped through the Takutai process so that when moments come up to engage with the CAP, that they're not being both educated and informed on the spot and then being expected to, to kind of say exactly what... I think that was the intention, was just to make sure that the community feels... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So the Takutai Kapiti group releasing yeah. information ahead of time so that people are prepared for their yeah, engagement yeah. sessions potentially? Yeah, that could potentially be. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good suggestion. Uh, Councillor Warwick. Yeah. 
Tatiana. I was just wondering. Oh, sorry. Wait. When no, no, the, go. When did the email come from with the feedback? I didn't note it. And would it have come in our focused emails or the other emails? Just, it would be good to. Maybe we'll forward that to Councillor Warwick again. Yes, we can do that. Oh, I can't great. remember the date. I'm sorry, I'd have and to find not, out offline. I'm going to throw him under the bus because of his memory. <laughs> it wasn't just me. Okay, I will resend the email. That's no problem at all. Yeah, the, the subject line wasn't didn't attract one to read it necessarily. Um, Andre. Uh, Ten Page 164, item 10. Um, there are no additional tangata whenua considerations relevant to this. I'm interested to know then what were those considerations if there's no addition. And the point I'm really wanting to raise again and seek direction from Council and with the assistance of Democratic Services is that I think there would be a genuine interest from Mana Whenua to support any of the community boards if they were needing to seek uh, support. Uh, in this case, for um, changes, increases to their remuneration. And again, I'm asking Council for direction. Do you think it's appropriate? Would it be helpful, for example, if Te Te Awahi Whakarungutai formally supported the Raumati Community Board on matters that are of benefit to those elected members and to those constituents who elected those people into those positions? I imagine because of what I think I know about ngā hapu engagement with the community board in Ōtaki, that we should be identifying in this particular item on our reports the actual response that you can report back to elected members of this council and community board members. And, and I'm encouraging us to develop that, um, that, that relationship so that when we come to these meetings, there is something that's stated in there from mana whenua not relying on staff uh, to have to provide that assurance or to provide that reference. I, I think it's an obligation that we inherit to ensure that we are visible in the reporting back to elected members. So I have referenced this. I don't want tangata whenua uh, items to, 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 to purely reflect the view of um, staff members. I think you need to ensure that you're satisfied that if there's something that we can add, uh, add value to by providing a statement in this section of your reporting, then please um, indicate that. Um, and I just note that in some of the previous reports today, this particular item isn't visible. Um, so for in terms of transparency and continuity, um, again, this is the reason why we need to sit at this table. So we can actually provide our support in our capacity as mana whenua to these matters that are of importance um, to our elected members and obviously to the district. Thanks, Andre. I think that's all stuff that we need to follow up over the fullness of time because uh, there's quite a lot in there. Darren, do you have any response? Or? Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Similar to, to Councillor Wilson, um, when, when Mr Baker does speak, he, he, he speaks with authority and, uh, and the points that you make are very relevant and, and, and definitely something that we as a councillor uh, and staff are, are working on to, to improve. So um, we really do appreciate your input. Thank you. So... I'm not seeing any light. So we have some recommendations up on the screen and one extra one. Can I dictate it, maybe? Uh, that the council notes that Takutai Kapiti are delivering community engagement and council encourages the group to provide information ahead of time so that participants can prepare for the meetings. Does that about cover it? Am 
might not be exact, but the sentiment of it comes across that people are really wanting information so that they can get their heads around it before, um, so they can have meaningful um, engagement with that group. I think. So if that doesn't, I, I think we've we've got the message and that covers some of it at least. Um, and I think under C. Um, we might need one that says uh, council will explore ways it can advocate to the remuneration authority and notes the uh, commit uh, not commitment but the the suggestion the, no the, not the yeah the the commitment I think that mana whenua will also feed into that process. It's all right? Okay, I'm just trying to ensure that we capture what our response is to these, yeah. these recommendations. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we just... It would be quite good if they could come under the one that they refer to. So, Takutai Kapiti needs to come under the Raumati one. And the other one needs to come under the um, Ōtaki one. So it would just be a bullet point. Another bullet point. Yep, and then under C, instead of D, that's just a bullet point. Yep, great. Everybody happy with that? Have I got a mover? Moved by Councillor Coford, seconded by Councillor Hanford. Any further comment or debate? All in favour, please say aye. Aye. That's carried. Uh, so we move on to item 11, confirmation of minutes. Nearly there, folks. Moved by Councillor Wilson. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. Okay. So we're now going to have lunch and we'll come back in half an hour. Sorry, hold fire a second. Okay, so because uh, the Deputy Mayor absconded halfway through that meeting, <laughs> Councillor Coe is now going to second that. I came in from my office.